Hello and welcome back. Today I'm going to take you step by step through the process of building my Stumac Dreadnought Guitar Kit. In this video we'll be completing the body. Make sure you stay till the end where I'll show you how to install the binding and purfling without the stress and anxiety. Picking up from where we left off, the top and sides are glued together and things are starting to take shape. The next step in the process is to install these reinforcing strips. Not all guitars have them, but high-end guitars typically do. They help shore up the sides and protect them from cracking should it suffer a slight knock. I taped each one in position to ensure they were the correct size and then applied the glue. I made these small calls out of cardboard and pieces of scrap wood. They help spread out the clamping pressure and the cardboard helps to avoid marring the workpiece. Moving on to the back, the first step is to line up the center line of the included plans with the joint between the two halves. I didn't show this part on camera, but the way I lined mine up was to clamp the plans to the back and then hold it up to the window. The paper is translucent enough to allow you to check the alignment just fine. Being satisfied with the position of the plans, I used an awl to mark out the corners of each brace. After I made my marks, I removed the plan and connected the dots with a straight edge. While I'm gluing these braces, let me tell you about something else that happened off camera. When I first lined up my plans, it became apparent that the rosewood back included with the kit was just a few millimeters too small. I contacted Stu Mac about the issue, and to my relief, they were more than happy to send out a replacement. When I opened up my replacement, however, I discovered that they had sent me mahogany by mistake. I contacted Stu Mac again, and I have to say, they were great. Without hassle or delay, they sent the correct part to me with expedited shipping. With all of that sorted, I set about gluing each brace. I don't know about you guys, but I find these cam clamps sometimes don't give me as much pressure as I'd like. So to remedy that, I use a wedge, in this case half of a clothespin, to get just that little extra clamping pressure on the workpiece. These center pieces help to shore up the relatively weak joint between the two halves. Next, I tapered the edges with a chisel. This old guitar saddle was about the right thickness for the end of the braces, so I used that as a guide. You guys might have noticed I'm wearing a coat here. Part of the reason it's taken so long to get this second part out is because the cold temperatures were really keeping me out of the workshop, and with daylight savings time, there often isn't a lot of time when I get home from work. Hopefully part three will be out much sooner. Before we can glue the back in place, we'll need to cut slots for the ends of each brace to rest in. Setting the braces into the body like this helps to prevent warping and separation over time. To mark the position of each brace, we line up the center lines of the back and sides and then clamp everything in place. Using a pencil, you can mark out the position of each brace. To remove the material, I alternated between using a file and a handsaw whenever it seemed appropriate. To determine exactly where I needed to trim my center brace, I sprinkled chalk on the tail block and pressed the top down. That allowed me to mark and cut off just the right amount for a perfect fit. And with that, it's time for the finishing touch. Finally, it's time to add the glue and clamp this thing down. After all this hard work, now comes one of the most stress-inducing parts of the build, routing the binding channels. Honestly, worrying about this kept me awake at night. Routers are wonderful, but they're very powerful and they can ruin months of work in fractions of a second. Initially, I didn't want to spend the money buying a routing jig like this one, but after putting so much work into this guitar, it felt like it was worth it. And boy was I right. In my opinion, this is the only way to go. 
The way it works is this cup-shaped piece here rides along the top of the guitar, allowing the router to move up and down on its axis to follow the contour of the sides. At the same time, the mount prevents it from tilting. This was worth every penny, and I would highly recommend the Stumac version or this equally great model made by Blues Creek Guitar. As an aside, I think it's important to be clear. I'm not in any way sponsored by Stu Mac. I have a lot of good things to say about them because they've treated me very well and I like their products. They are expensive, but you get what you pay for. I actually had a piece of this jig break because I dropped it, and Stu Mac sent me a replacement part right away at no charge. All that aside, using this jig really made the process easy and I'm so glad I decided to do it that way. After trimming the edges with a flush trim bearing, it's time to route the channel for the binding. Stumac doesn't tell you this in the instructions, but what you'll need is a 1.5mm bearing for the binding and a 5mm bearing for the herringbone purfling. Before touching the guitar with the router, you'll want to check the fit of the binding on a test piece. This 1.5mm bearing is actually just a bit too deep. Adding a piece of tape though makes it perfect. Spruce is notorious for its tendency to break along the grain. For that reason, it's recommended that you stop at these key areas and run the piece through backwards. This is called a climb cut. Climb cuts don't tend to tear out wood, but they make it harder to control the router. Because this routing jig stabilizes everything so well, and because I'm a bit of a scaredy cat, I decided to do the entire thing as a climb cut, and it came out great. I just had to pause here and admire the beauty of these rosewood shavings. I usually hate having everything covered in sawdust, but there's just something so beautiful about rosewood that makes me almost a bit sad to clean it up. With the binding channel complete, I switch bearings, run another test piece, and cut the purfling channel. There's one more binding channel to be cut, and that's on the tail block. Now Stumac includes a larger piece of binding to be used here. I did mine a little differently, but either way, the process is the same. First measure and mark out the location of the binding channel, and then score it with a sharp knife. After that, you'll need to either saw or chisel along these lines. It's okay to cut all the way through because the sides are being held together by the tail block underneath. It would have worked out better for me to actually buy a small chisel. Instead, I made this makeshift chisel from an old flathead screwdriver. It worked okay, but I wouldn't recommend it. Next, I installed the binding and scraped it flush. For the binding, I'm using a PVA cement. This solvent-based glue works by partially dissolving the plastic, bonding it to the wood when it dries. Before you begin, you'll want to be ready with plenty of tape and paper towels to manage the squeeze out. It's a messy process, and there's something about this glue that's a real pain to get off your hands. I think it partially dissolves the skin on your fingers. At least you could say it's exfoliating. One thing I've learned is to pay extra attention to the waist of the guitar. The binding here can easily be pulled loose, so you'll want to make sure it's held down really well. When it comes to attaching the herringbone purfling, you have a few more options open to you. Some people use CA glue, but I prefer tight bond. When I installed the first herringbone strip, I started at one end and worked my way to the other. I realized I'd made a mistake when the bend for the waist wasn't lining up with the shape of the guitar. Fortunately, that problem is easy to solve. A little heat from a hairdryer makes the purfling soft and pliable, allowing you to bend it however you need. For reference, this is what you should do. Start at the waist and work your way out. When you reach the center line, trim it off carefully with a chisel to join the two halves.
After giving the glue a full 24 hours to dry, it's time to remove the guitar from its mummy-like sarcophagus. Use a hairdryer to loosen the adhesive on the tape before removing it, otherwise you'll actually take pieces of the spruce along with it. After clearing the channel of any excess glue, it's time to install our last section of binding. I've said it before and I'll say it again, there's nothing quite so satisfying as inlay work. It just feels so good to scrape away the excess material and glue to reveal something beautiful underneath. And with that, the body is done. Make sure to subscribe and hit that notification bell so you won't miss part 3 where we'll be building the neck and this guitar finally starts to take shape. See you then!